Welcome back. Today we're going to have a video on the computational efficiency of Gaussian elimination. Specifically, we want to answer the question, how many operations do I have to do in order to row reduce a matrix to perform this Gaussian elimination? And that question is pretty broad, so we're going to make some simplifying assumptions. The first assumption is that my matrix, which I'll call A, is square. This is not absolutely required, of course, to do a row reduction, but it will make my numbers come out nicely. Uh, and I need to assume that my matrix is regular, uh, and that way I won't have to take uh, keep track of any of the permutations of the rows when I do a row reduction. And I'm going to assume that my entries are generic. Generic in this setting means that I'm not going to make any particular assumptions about the form of my matrix. In particular, I'm not going to assume that my matrix is sparse. A sparse matrix is one with a lot of zero entries. When you have a sparse matrix, well, let's just say that other methods apply in that setup. Similarly, I won't assume that my matrix is what's called tridiagonal, where it's definitely non-zero off of the uh, main diagonal and the immediate superdiagonal and subdiagonal. Again, other methods apply there too. They're more efficient. Instead, I'll assume just any old matrix. Now, I'm not going to count input and output operations right into the hard drive and pulling things from memory. This really depends on your, on your implementation of the algorithm. And what we're trying to get at is a base. You know, what is the complexity of the mathematics required? So all we're going to count are the number of times we add and the number of times we multiply. This analysis will be complicated enough without uh, any additional stuff. No more considerations will be required to, to make you convinced. Uh, now, additions and multiplications, well, what about subtractions, uh, you might ask, or what about divisions, because frequently you find yourself dividing by two. But this is really the same floating point operation that your computer is implementing. Subtraction is the same as addition, and division is the multiplication, uh, the, the same as multiplication. So we're not going to worry too much about that. And so let's start with our setup here. I have my generic n by n matrix. And how does the algorithm work? Well, uh, again, I'm assuming that my matrix is regular. So this first pivot, A11, is definitely not zero. So the first step in my algorithm is to compute, well, A21 divided by A11, A31 divided by A11, A411 divided by A11, and so on all the way down this uh, first column, AN1 divided by A11. I'm going to compute all of those numbers. How many multiplications is that? And again, division is multiplication. So let's just say this is exactly N minus one multiplication type operations that my computer has to do. And now that I've computed those numbers, I don't need this column anymore. And I'll show you why. So in the second step, I'm going to update the entries of the matrix because I'm going to assume that I cleared out this column underneath the first pivot, A11. So I'm updating the entries of the matrix. For example, A21, the thing right below A11, gets replaced with A21 minus A, or A21 over A11 times A11. That's the row operation you would need to do to clear out the A21. All of those cancel, and so you get zero. So I'm not going to actually do that operation. I'm just going to set it equal to zero because I picked this row operation exactly to set A21 to zero. But A22 in the second row gets replaced by the same row operation because I'm doing, yeah, by this by, by this thing, A22 minus A21 over A11, A12. And similarly, AIK, so in the ith row and kth column, what I have to replace this by in order to do the row operation that clears out AI1, I have to do AIK minus AI1 over A11, A1K. Okay, so that's great. And when I do that, I get zeros underneath my A11. I get some kind of submatrix with stuff in it. And I get my first row left unchanged. Now, for each replacement that I do, well, okay, so there's this is an n minus 1 by, by n minus 1 submatrix where I need to replace these entries, these AIKs. Now each replacement 
costs me, we have to look at it, let's see. Each replacement costs me exactly one multiplication, that's right here in red, because I already computed this number AIJ, or A1, AI1 over A11 times A1K. So that I have to multiply that by A1K, and then I have to subtract the result from some other number that I already have in memory, which is an addition. So altogether, how many multiplications do I have? Well, there were the first, uh, there's, the, there's this n minus 1 squared uh, that we just did in the, in the replacement in the update step, and the n minus 1 where I computed those fractions in the first place. So I add those together, that's how many multiplications I need. And there's only n plus 1 squared additions. So here's a picture of my updated matrix. Now I've written A22 with a red star, because it's not the old A22. It's been replaced uh, by doing the row operation from the first row. So again, I have to... So I'm just going to rinse and repeat that same algorithm. I'm going to take this A22 star. That's definitely not 0, because my matrix is regular. And I'm going to clear out what's below it because that's my next pivot. So those numbers, uh, the fractions I need to compute are A32 over A22, A42 over A22, all the way down to AN2 over A22. Those are the fractions that I'm going to use to, to compute what row operation I have to do. And how many multiplications is that? Again, multiplications are divisions. Well, that's just N minus two of them. So now again, I have to update my matrix, and I'm only going to update what's underneath this blue dashed line that I have here. So I need to replace things in the i-th row and k-th column by aik minus ai2 over a22 a2k. Well, how many times do I have to do that? Again, I don't have to worry about what's directly beneath the a22 star. Those are all just going to be set to zero. I don't need to do multiplications and additions for those. So if you look in the n minus 2 squared size box, the blue box there, that's how many multiplications I need in those replacement steps. And that's how, and also that's how many additions I need, because that's an n minus 2 by n minus 2 submatrix. So if you count up the total, very similarly to last time, you see that you have n minus 2 squared plus n minus 2 multiplications. And you have n minus 2 squared additions. Of course, in your new matrix, you don't need to worry, you don't need to compute that a32 star is going to be sent to 0 in the updated matrix. You know it's going to be 0, so just set it to be 0. Similarly, a 4 2 star through a n 2 star. Just set them to zero. You don't need to compute that. So now we have a pretty good idea of what this algorithm looks like. Let's see what happens in the jth step, where j is some number between 1 and n. So I grab my a j j star. That's the pivot that's been updated after doing this j minus 1 times. And I have to clear underneath pivot j. So again, the first step is to compute a bunch of fractions. These are a j plus 1 j over a j j, a j plus 2 j over a j j, all the way down to a n j over a j j. These fractions are what I'll use for my row operation. How many of them are there? Well, there's n minus j of them. That's how big this blue rectangle is, and you can see that pattern proceeding from the last two slides. Next, I'll just set the entries below my jth pivot to zero. So that's a j plus one j through a n j. Set them all to zero. I don't need to worry about computing them. And now I need to update the rest of my matrix. That's what's in the blue rectangle there. And following the same pattern as we had before, if you compute what row operation will clear a j plus one j, for example, uh, into a zero, you need to replace in the i-th row and k-th column, where i is bigger than j and so is k, uh, you need to replace that entry with aik minus aij over ajj, ajk. But you only need to do that inside that blue rectangle, which is a size n minus j squared. So 
you get n minus j squared additions from that, and you get n minus j squared multiplications from that. Again, just like the last two slides, but it's j instead of one or two. So altogether, you get n minus j squared plus n minus j multiplications. and n minus j squared additions. So now we just have to add up over j all of the different additions and multiplications that we had. Well, j was a variable, really. You're going to let j range from 1 up to n. And if you factor, you'll find that the number of multiplications you do is the summation of n minus j times n minus j plus 1 multiplications. And the summation as j ranges from 1 to n of n minus j squared additions. Now, computing what these sums are involves essentially knowing some basic facts about the summation of squared integers. Um, this is not such a big deal. Uh, after you add up, you find that you get n, minus, n cubed minus n over 3 multiplications and 2n cubed minus 3n squared plus n over 6 additions. Well, really the point here is that each of these asymptotically is approaching n cubed over 3. You'll find that when n is very large, if n is 1 million, that 3n squared is not very important in comparison to the 2n cubed. Okay. Now, of course, if you're doing an augmented matrix, you would have an additional column that you were performing these operations on but it wouldn't count for a pivot. So that last column, it turns out, gives you an additional summation of n minus j of each operation, because you only have the update step. You don't have the um, pivot clearing fraction step. So after all, we are doing our best to solve a system of linear equations. And that means that we're going to need to analyze the back substitution step and not just the reduced to upper triangular form step. Say we started out solving ax equals b, and b is that augmented column vector from the last slide. So after we row reduce, we're now ending up solving some other system of equations. It probably looks like ux equals c, where c is the finished augmented column after we've reduced to upper triangular form, and u is the upper triangular form for a. So, the last equation looks like unnxn equals cn, and that one's pretty easy to solve. You just divide by unn, so that's one multiplication. The next equation up is a little bit more complicated, but still not too bad. It says un minus 1 n minus 1 times xn minus 1 plus un minus 1 n times xn is equal to cn minus 1. And you can solve that for xn minus 1 in terms of xn and uns and cns. Just subtract and divide. And you can count how many additions and multiplications that involved. And at the end of the day, if you're solving for xj, the first time you see it is in the jth equation up from the bottom. In order to compute it, you're going to need to divide by 1 over ujj, and you'll multiply by the following. cj minus a summation from j plus 1 to n of ujk xk. And how many multiplications is that all together? This should highlight the whole computation for xj, not just the summation. And when you count up, you get n minus j plus 1 multiplications, and you get n minus j additions. So with our back substitution step, where do we end up? Well, altogether, if we add up how many multiplications, you get the summation of n minus j plus 1, as j ranges from 1 to n. And that's relatively easy to compute, is n squared plus n over 2 multiplications. And how many additions? Well, again, the summation is the sum from j equals 1 to n of n minus j. And again, it's pretty easy to see that that's n squared minus n over 2 
additions. So if you are solving ax equals b, then, well, if you add up how many multiplications uh, in back substitution and how many in row reduction, you find that you get n cubed plus 3n squared minus n over 3 multiplications. And a similar number, uh, 2n cubed plus 3n squared minus 5n over 6 additions. So what I want to do for the rest of the video is to compare this number with the number of operations it takes to use the inverse to solve ax equals b by multiplying both sides by the inverse. Uh, so it's going to turn out that the inverse is less efficient than just doing row reduction and back substitution. Again, the, the idea in, in using the inverse is that if you already know the inverse, you can just multiply by it and get your solution right away. So, first I need to count how many operations it takes just to compute the inverse. To do that, we'll use a, a fairly standard algorithm where you augment your matrix with the identity matrix and row reduce that. Reduce it first to upper triangular form, and you'll find that you have an upper triangular matrix on the left and a, lower, a special lower triangular matrix on the right. We computed just now that that is going to take you about n cubed over three operations as for large n. Asymptotically, it's going to be n cubed over 3. And the next step is to perform upward row operations. Here, again, you have an upper triangular uh, matrix, so the green entries uh, are non-zero, and you have a special lower triangular matrix there on the right, so that it's got ones on the diagonal. Zeros below and above these diagonals. The problem, oh, and of course the entries in the, the green triangles are basically generic. There's not much you can say about them. The problem is that the width of this trapezoid that I've drawn is n. So I'm going to have to perform upward row operations in order to reduce u to the identity matrix, which is going to give me my inverse L. That's the normal algorithm. There are other algorithms for finding the inverse, uh, particularly common ones to find the adjugate, uh, but you'll find that that's less computationally efficient, not more. Um, so the difficulty is that you get about n cubed multiplications for large n in order to do these upward row, uh, upward row operations. So what that means is that if you're going to compute the inverse with this method, you end up with about 4n cubed over 3 multiplications and a similar number of additions. So what's our conclusion here? Suppose that you are solving a system of linear equations ax equals b, a is some n by n matrix, and b is some n by one column vector. And you want to use the inverse method. We've learned some things about the method of multiplying by both sides of that equation by the inverse. The first thing that's, I hope, clear is that as a, as a concept, this is a wonderful concept. It's just beautiful. You just multiply on both sides by a, a, some other matrix, and you magically get your response. You get your answer. It's fantastic. But as an algorithm, well, the algorithms that we have to compute the inverse don't measure up to the algorithms that we have for row reduction. They're just not as good. And so if you're going to try to solve a system of linear equations in practice with large n, you're going to give an LU decomposition with Gaussian elimination and you're going to back substitute. That's the conclusion.